Good evening. I hope you're enjoying your week so far. Thank you for tuning in to the NEC Youth Service for our CAP meeting this year in 2021. Um, I hope you have enjoyed the main message by our guest pastor um, over at our main service. Um, if you have not, it's online, so you feel free to tune in. Um, and here at the youth service, what we're doing is that we're doing throwback series from the messages over the past eight years. Um, and today, this evening, our message will be from Milton Brown. And the message for this evening was delivered at the NEC Students Day in 2018. And it is titled Created for a Purpose. I hope you'll be blessed by today's message and the music by Non Tobago and Non Ye. Um, continue to tune in and tell a friend to tell a friend. Enjoy the rest of your evening and the rest of your week.
Praise God. It's a blessing to be in God's house. I came over several thousand miles to speak to someone today. It's amazing when I speak around the world how God's Holy Spirit follows. And he's going to rest with us today. I want to thank Adam, the pastor, Adam Randon, and his beautiful wife, Aiko. Thank you for your hospitality to an old man. Let him get a good night's sleep. Thank you for the church. When I look out on this audience and I see all of the young people here in Leicester, England, I said it right. It cheers my heart because I want to tell you that in many places around the world, young people are banding together to finish God's work. And I believe that this group of young people are part of that army. I just want you for, for, for one time just for one Sabbath morning, put, put all your cares away. Put all your thoughts. And, and just on this morning, for old man, they call me Uncle Milty. For Uncle Milty. I want you to think about God and what he's saying to you. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray? God, in this room is so much potential. God, in this room, you have doctors and lawyers, philosophers, ministers of the gospel, future preachers, God. And you, you sent me here, God, to say a word to someone. And I'm willing Oh, open our hearts and our minds to this word we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we want to talk about the title, Created for His Purpose. What did I say? Man, Lester, England, you guys are awake. All right. It's exciting to be in this house with all of these future doctors and lawyers, innovators, inventors, accountants, all of you being trained to fulfill a purpose. And this morning, we want to talk about what that purpose actually is. Let me ask a question this morning. How many people actually believe they have a purpose? Just raise your hand. I got to see the hands. If you believe you have a purpose, raise your hand. How many people know their purpose? It's quite interesting when you ask that question. Do you have a purpose? Yes. Yes, I have a purpose. Do you know your purpose? Yes. No. It, the same answer to that question when I, whether I'm speaking in China or Jamaica or South America or America, the same answer by young people, you gave the same answer. Many hands go up when we're asked, do we have a purpose? Yes. We're quite sure. But when we ask, do you know your purpose? Sometimes the response is quite different. I want to say this morning that every person has a God-given purpose. Every person in this church house in Leicester, England, has a purpose appointed by God 
But I want to add something to you that you may not be quite familiar with. You have a purpose that was given to you before you were born. We sometimes really overlook this biblical fact in our church and in our homes. Uh, how many, I want to take another poll. How many of you have been told by a parent, maybe a mentor, maybe a, an advisor or a friend or a pastor, that you can be anything you want to be? Have you ever heard that? How, how many? I got to see the hands because I've heard it. You can be anything you want to be. But actually, that's not really biblically correct. You were created for something bigger than just anything you want to be. That's a problem with our church society, that we cast our own purpose based on our own aspirations. We, we cast our purpose about what we want to do in our lives based on how we feel. And I want to break through on a point today that you have something that's much higher. You were actually created for God's purpose. Well, what does the word purpose mean? Anybody can give me the Webster's Dictionary meaning of purpose. Oh, don't look at your iPhone, don't look at your iPhone. Purpose. Anybody bold enough to tell me what purpose is? The meaning. She said, I got it right here. Purpose. Purpose is the reason for which something is created. The definition of purpose is the reason for something is created. The reason for which it exists. That's the definition. Purpose cannot be bought. Purpose cannot be trained. Purpose cannot be inherited. Purpose cannot be earned. Purpose is not random. Purpose is not established by your parents. Purpose is not your desire of what you want to do. And this last one, purpose cannot be lost. Uncle Milty, what are you saying this to me this morning? I'm saying God created something in you which is called purpose, and he did it before you were born. Let's go to the word of God, Judges chapter 13 we find Samson. We call him Sammy. He's my, Sammy is my, just my favorite Bible character. He wasn't Samson then. He, was, he wasn't even born. In, Ju in Judges chapter 13, we find Samson's parents were being told by an angel before he was born that he would be delivered to, to them and that he shouldn't cut his hair. And, and, and then they, the angel said something very interesting. It says, and he will deliver Israel from the Philistines. Samson was not born. But God had given him a purpose even before he was born. Jeremiah 1.5. 1, 1, it says, before I formed you in the womb. I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. In case you don't believe Jeremiah, Isaiah says it in Isaiah 49, 5. And now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant. Purpose. Created by God. Little Davy, you know David the king. 
Little Davy says something in Psalms 190, 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days adorned for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Little Davy says, young people, before my body was formed, everything appointed to me was written in God's book. Even before I came to be. Genesis 1, 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Young people of England, male and female, he created them. This morning, I want to tell you that God created you in his image. And he created you in his image with purpose. I want you to say with me, I have purpose. It was before I was born. What happens when you create someone in your image? You look like them. You talk like them. I got four people walking around this earth that look like me. They talk like me. They walk like me. <laughs> Create it in his image means you carry their features. How do you carry one's features? They carry my features because they have my DNA. I'm here to tell someone something you've never heard before. God's purpose is planted in your DNA. God's purpose is planted in your DNA. That's how you're made in his image. What are you getting to, Uncle Milty? I want to tell you some, how this is supported. DNA creates proteins. And proteins make up cells. Cells make up organs, and organs make up you in your image. And God has planted his purpose in your life so that you can create the image of him here on this earth. Purpose is not something you think of. Purpose is created in you before you were born. Why? Why did God create us for his purpose? Why? Why did he think of what would Adam Ramdom do for me before he was born? Or Naomi? Or Eddie? Why, why, why? What did God think about when he thought about you? I, 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 I like this, this question. What was God thinking when he created you? God told Moses something very interesting in Exodus 9, 16. Eddie read it very forcefully. But I raised you up for this purpose, that I may show you my power, and that my name may be proclaimed through all the earth. That's why he created you. God says, I'm going to, I created you for a very specific thing to do on this earth. 
And, and I'm not going to just leave you alone. I'm going to give you my power. And when I give you my power, you will know your purpose because you will proclaim my name throughout the earth. That's purpose. 1983, I had uh, graduated from Oakwood Adventist Academy, Huntsville, Alabama. It took God 10 years after graduating from high school for me to really understand and for him to reveal his power to me. Somebody sitting here this morning and God has not revealed his power to you. I want to tell you, it took me 10 years before he revealed his power to me. I was in the University of Alabama and uh, has started in on doing a PhD in organic chemistry. No African American in the history of the United States had completed a degree in organic chemistry at that school. First two years were going along pretty great, pretty good, pretty, pretty good. physical chemistry. I survived. Organic chemistry, I survived. Analytical chemistry, I survived. Biochemistry, I survived. In America, if you do well on your courses, you have a chance to take a test that will allow you to preclude take, getting a master's degree. And you can go straight for the doctorate. So I took this exam called the candidacy exam. And God blessed me. And I was standing before my committee and they said to me these words I'll never forget. Milt Brown, you passed the candidacy exam. But in order to get your PhD, you have to make a new drug. What? Well, where, I'm, I'm asking you, where do you start to make a new medicine? How, 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 do, you, how do you start? I stood there perplexed. I went home to my wife, and uh, I'll never forget what Sandy told me. She said, Milk, God has brought you this far. He will not leave you. I want to pause real quick, because I think I have to tell someone here today Thank you, Holy Spirit. My, my, my wife and I have been together from high school. We got our high school degrees, our college degrees, and our doctorates together. Sometimes God plants people in your, your, your lives for a time when you need someone the most. I, I'm speaking to somebody this morning. I, that word is not for everyone here in this room. Somebody needs to hear that there's someone in your life that God has planted. They've planted them there to help you through this time. Young people, don't take your, your relationships for granted in this world where we can Facebook, Twitter, all of the different things that we can do to have friends. Don't take your friendships for granted. Because one day you're going to need to turn to somebody when you don't know what to do. 
and you're going to need that person in your life. Choose your friends carefully. My wife, she said, Milk, God will not abandon you. So I went into the laboratory and I, I began to I begin to pray, God, God, please, if you brought me this far, I need your help. And, and, and I'll tell you, it's a prayer, I'll share this prayer with you that I said that day. God, make me worthy enough that you will share with me your secrets. I remember sitting there in that chair, and it came to me for the first time, the ability to see a molecule in three dimensions. Well, what, what do I mean by that? What does Uncle Milty mean by that? You, you ever been to IMAX theater? to see those nature shows, nature shows, <laughs> nature shows. You, you know when you put the glasses on and, and you, you, that, that picture comes out of the screen and that, 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 that animal is in, in that nature is, is in the three dimensions. It was that day that God revealed his power to me that I could see without using those glasses three dimensions for a molecule. And I remember seeing this molecule, a phenyl ring and an amide group and an and a aliphatic ring and a hydroxyl group coming towards me. And, and I saw it and I, I wrote it down on paper. And I was so happy and so excited. And I went to my advisor. I said, hey, hey, I got this idea. And, and, and he said, that's ridiculous. Instantly, my hopes and my dreams were dashed. Someone that I had looked up to and, 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 and respected had said that the idea that I had seen this molecule was not real. I went home crushed. And there, when I opened the door, my wife Sandy said, go back to the lab. God has something for you. And I did as any good husband, Adam. <laughs> I went back to the lab. And I sat on my cot, and I was sitting there, and I said, God, please, I have nothing else but you. And I remember taking that flask and putting on top of it the condenser and, and then allowing that condenser to go into a trap and putting on that heat, and then I began to pour in my chemicals that I would use to try to make this molecule. And I remember putting in the stir bar and clicking that stir bar around. And, 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 and then as I was sitting there on, the, on, on, the, on, on, on my cot, because I had planned to spend the night, I, 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 I saw crystals forming in this flask. And, and, and these crystals began to be white crystals as something was going on. Something was happening. And I took my, 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 my spatula and I, I, I scraped some of the crystals out and I put it in a, a little tube for NMR, a nuclear magnetic, magnetic resonance, which allows me to see the bonds. And when I put that, put that in, the, in the instrument, all of a sudden I could see that the bonds. The bonds that connected the hydrogens for each molecule were there. God had revealed to me a molecule. And I was saying, thank you, God. It was about that time that, that a man from, from the NIH had told me, the National Institute of Health, 
said, hey, uh, Dr. Brown, I wasn't a doctor yet. He said, if you ever have a molecule that you want to send, here's my card. And I had that card for some reason. It was on my desk. I scooped that molecule up. I put it in a vial, and I sent a gram of that molecule to the National Institute of Health. I didn't think any more of it. I began to keep doing my work. And about six months later, I get this letter in the mail. It says, Dr. Brown, I still wasn't a doctor yet. You have created a compound that is one of the, our most potent anti-seizure medicines that we have seen. I, I, I want to tell somebody here today that when God creates purpose for you, nothing is impossible. Forty patents later, I make medicines just routinely. I'll trip up and there's one. But when I was in your age group, when I was, when I was fighting and when I was unsure of myself of what God's purpose was for me, I didn't know where to turn. The first thing I want you to know, young people, is that God has a plan for you. And in order to understand the plan, you got to understand him so that he'll reveal the plan for you. That Bible text means a lot to me. But I raised you up for a specific purpose. To show Milt Brown my power. That he'll go around the world, even to Leicester, England. And he'll tell people about my greatness. This morning, I want you to be reflective. Do, do you want to know God's power? You're a young person that you, you may not have, you, 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 you don't know your purpose. But Uncle Milty came here from a long ways to tell you this, that your purpose was planted in you before you were born. God planted Milt Brown, the medicine maker, the drug discoverer, the person who invents new medicines in me before I was created. And, and, and maybe he won't give you a special power of seeing a molecule in 3D. In, in fact, I have to share something. When, when, when young people come and work for me, and, and young people come from all over the world to work for me, when they come, I always ask this question. I put this molecule up, and I ask them, how do you see that molecule? Well, one of my prayers is that God will reveal to me the person that will take my place. I'm always asking God, let, let me see that person. And, and, and maybe that person is here in Leicester, England. I don't know, but, but I, I, I'm here to tell somebody. Not, not the whole group that's here of wonderfully beautiful people dressed immaculately and, and looking real nice. I just came here to tell one person that God has a purpose for you. Play something. We're going to finish this. Got to land this plane somewhere. They said be done by 1 o'clock. Got to be done by 1 o'clock. I, 
I had finished my PhD. And uh, thank you, Holy Spirit. I finished my PhD, and as clear as that voice had told me that this is the molecule that I have for you. That same voice said, Mild, it's time for you to do my purpose for you. See, as an undergraduate in biology, I, I had taken the MCAT, and the Medical College Admissions Test in the United States is the exam that allows you to go into medicine. And I'd failed the test. So, so and I'm going to be so honest and transparent with you because you may never see me again. I failed this test. It's one, of, one of my friends, when I told him my score, he said, mm. Blind monkey could have done better than that. I said, thanks. I was like a ship without a rudder. Not knowing what to do. And I heard that voice say, I have something for you. This morning, that voice is speaking to you. I have something for you. I have something for you to do. See, when I finished that PhD, that same voice said, Milk, it's time for you to go to medical school. What, God? I already took that test. And the test said no. Take it again. So quietly, embarrassed, I took the test again. And, and, and when the scores came back, I didn't even want to open the page. I just I know what it's going to be. But I had to open it. I opened it up and God had made a way. And I took, took that paper and I was rejoicing. And, 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 and God opened a door for me to go to University of Virginia School of Medicine. Full scholarship. In America, when you want to become a doctor, you typically come out of school $250,000 in debt. I went to the University of Virginia, as, as Adam told you. And I, I said, God, when I'm here, I'm going to do the things you ask me to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start a campus ministry. I'm going to be a part of, 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 a, of a society of young people that, that, that will love you. And we started that ministry in our home every week. We fed every student that came into that university. When we were away, we gave them our key to our home and we let them have their worship services in our home when we weren't even there. And the first year went fine. We were doing well in the school. I took anatomy and physiology and biochemistry. And second year came, and I was taking this course called neuroscience. Anybody ever heard of neuroscience? And uh, first test came. Took the test. Went to look at my score on the wall. 90, 80, 70, 60, 50, 40. 
party. Lord, what happened? I failed. See, I'm going to talk to you like no one else have talked to you. I have no heirs. Fail the first test. Went home and I told my wife I failed the first test. I'm going to do fine, honey. I'm going to study harder. And I did. I got tutors. And I got old exams. And I got friend study group and I was doing those things and the second test came and I felt prepared and I went and I said God I prayed and I'm, I asked him God I, I need your help I know you're going to help me and here we go <clears throat> the scores came and I, I walked up confidently here it is here it is 90 80 70 60 50 40 Lord, what's happening? This time, this time I was in trouble because there's one more test. Oh, well, let me ask you a question. Where do you go when it seems impossible? How, how, how do you react? When you're in a place that you, you don't know how to get out of. There's someone in this place right here who's failing. You're too embarrassed to get help. There's someone here right now struggling with addictions. Failing. We're not talking to the older people because they got their own set of problems. Divorce and, 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 and lost jobs and, and debt and, 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 and all the things that go with that. Where are you when you're in trouble? So I was in trouble and I prayed to God. I said, Lord, please. Why did you bring me here, God? Sometimes you got to have a personal conversation with God. Why did you bring me here? Some older person may say, why did you allow me to marry that person? I tried everything. I did what you asked me. I, I had a Bible study group. I participated in church. God, I already had a doctorate degree. I didn't need another one. Why you bring me to this place to embarrass me? In the, in the peak of my anger, God said this. I have something special for you to do. Last test. This is called the Hail Mary. Y'all know that term? All right. This is when the footballers, the, the soccer guys, when they take the person out, the goalie out the net, they bring everybody forward. This is it. I went to church. And I had the people pray for me in the Wednesday night prayer meeting. But, but, but I did something real, real devious. I went to the little kids and I said, hey, little baby, would you pray for me? Because I know that God going to hear the little baby's prayers. And I studied. Let me tell you how I was studying. For some of you who are sitting there with the smirk on your face under, he probably didn't study. Let me tell you how I was studying. I get up in the morning and study from six to eight. I go to class from eight to five. I come home, I be with my parent, my, parent, my kids and my wife from five to seven. I go to the library and I study from seven to one. And I did that every night until it came to the Friday on the Sabbath. I would not study. 
on Saturday night when the sun would go down, I'd get my books. As soon as the sun would go down, I would study till 2 o'clock, and I'd go to bed. I'd get up in the morning on Sunday. I'd eat. I'd kiss my son and my, my daughters and my wife, and then I'd go to the library from about 10 to about 12 o'clock at night. Putting in the effort. Well, what happens when you put in the effort and things don't go right? Where do you go? Took the test. I sat there. I took my test. I finished a little bit early. And uh, I went home. I came back a few days later to check my grade. 90. 80. 70, 60, 40, 30, Lord, what happened? Where are you? I went home in tears. How, how can I tell my wife I failed? How can I tell I'm losing my scholarship? I get a call from the dean's office, uh, I need you to come to the office. I go into the office. Dean Pearson was there and he said, Milt, you failed. I said, I know, sir. I gave it all I had. I even asked God to be with me. And it seemed like he failed me. He said, I'm gonna have to take your scholarship you know that, right? And the tears begin to come down my eyes. How am I going to take care of my family? I left that day out of his office devastated. When I got home, there was another message that said, Hey, Milk, we have an opportunity for you to take that neuroscience class in Vermont in the summer, but you gotta come up with $5,000. I said, well, that's impossible. Where am I gonna get $5,000? I'm not working, I'm in school. My parents can't afford to do anything to help me. I had resigned in my heart that I would fail. There's someone in this place who here today who came on that train, who came to this place, who have resigned in their heart that they have failed. And I'm talking to you. The, the dean called me, said, hey, come to my office. I said, yes, sir. I went to his office, he said, you know, I found $5,000 for you to take this course. That meant I had to leave my family for a summer. So I'm sitting in class, in the back of class, and another young man comes and sits, he looks really sad, worse than I guess I was looking. I said, hey, Chris, what's, what's going on, man? He said, man, I failed a class. I said, what, what class? He said, I failed a class called neuroscience. I turned to him, I said, man, I failed too. Two failures sitting there. And I, I said, he said, you failed? The PhD guy? I said, yeah, I failed. He says, well, I'm able to take a class in Vermont. What about you? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm able to take a class in Vermont. I said, I don't know how to get there. He says, I have a car. And I remember that morning, I'll never forget. I'll never forget this morning that he came to my house. Adam, he came to that house that you ate so many dinners at.
And when he opened the door and I sat down, I heard this song. There's no weapon formed against me. It won't work. God will do what he says he would do. He's not a man that will lie. Fred Hammonds was playing that morning, and I remember. We drove up to, 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 to Vermont, and we got there next to the emergency room. We had a cheap room. It had no air conditioner. It was summertime, and we were coming into the room, and my, the, the young man that was with me said, hey, Milt, let's kneel down and pray. Kneel down and pray for what? So just kneel down. So I knelt down. This young man said, God, keep this room cool. Deliver us from this fiery furnace. Feed us. Help us to overcome our struggles. And, and, and just as we were praying, I'm serious, I heard this knock. Knock on the door, a young man comes busting in. I heard you through the window. Your windows are open. And, and I, I failed neuroscience. Can I come pray with you? And the next night, five more people came. The next 10, we moved from our room into an open area. 20, the next night, 40, the next night, young people who failed neuroscience. And then it hit me as I began to see young people who had never heard about the voice of God begin to say, teach me something from God's word. That God didn't need me to pass neuroscience to do his purpose. I'm speaking to somebody here. You're doing everything you can. There's going to be one last service where you come to perfunctory and you just come here for no reason. God is speaking to someone here. Let me tell you something. I'm not bragging, and, and Adam knows I'm not that kind of guy. I never scored so high on neuroscience in my entire life. realize that God didn't need neuroscience for him to do his purpose in my life. Let's fast forward a few years because I'm closing this one at one o'clock. I'm done. I had made tenure at the University of Virginia. I graduated from medical school. Yes. Oh, oh, I'll tell you this before we go. Can, can I have five minutes? Give me five minutes. It's one o'clock. Can you give me the 105? 105. We were coming home, and we got back to Charlottesville after we took the course, and the dean calls me into the office. This is my third year of medical school. Medical school is four years. I walked in the door. I said, sir, I, I think I passed that course. He says, something else. I said, Lord, what else? He says, you passed your US LME boards, licensing boards. You passed the only class you needed to graduate. The board has voted that you'll graduate a year early. And, 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 and you're the first one finished in your class. Congratulations. And I want you to understand, young people, you don't need neuroscience to do God's will. But God has a sense of humor. 2006, Georgetown University offered me to come to be a full endowed chair. 
That means they put four and a half million dollars behind this chair. I got the interest off it, plus a nice salary and all this stuff. But they made me endow chair in physiology, oncology, pharmacology, molecular biology, and neuroscience. <laughs> For some reason, they couldn't see that bad grade that had been there all that time. I, I know I'm in England, and I know they don't do this in England. But God called me to ask somebody. If, if, if you want to know God's will in your life, I just want you to come here with me. I'm going to pray with you. I, I know they don't do this in England. If, if you are bold enough to come forward, God will tell you, I, I got something for you that you can't even imagine. I didn't come here for this big audience. I came here for one person. requirement is, is that you're going to give God your heart. That you're going to do what he asks you to do so that he can give you his plan. Come on in. Come on in. Come on up. Come on up. Close. Come on up. We got to touch. I'm not going to hurt you. Come on. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on around. Come on. Pack it in. Pack it You come around. You can come around. <laughs> Where do you go when you don't have the answer? Eddie, where do you go? What do you, what, what do, you do? When you fail beyond measure, God is still there with you. I see your tears. I see him and God sees them. There's no course. There's no person. There's no, there's no institution that can keep you away from a purpose that he put in you before you were created. Not after you fail. But he put the purpose in you before you were even born. Nobody can stop that. Let's bow our heads. Father God, Lord, you brought me from Brookfield, Maryland, all the way to Leicester, England, to tell somebody that you raised me up for a specific purpose. That you showed me your power. And then in spite of failures and man's failures, God, you showed me power that would overcome and that I could proclaim your name throughout the earth. God, you see what you see here. Young people bold enough to stand up for you. Lord, you created them for a purpose. And right now, God, we're not sure of that purpose sometimes. We, we're standing here in tears. Crying out to you, God, please. Father God, I'm just going to ask you to do what you do. And right now in this place, God, give them peace. Because only you can give peace, God. Give them peace to know that you're going to bring them through. Lord, there's some older people who are sitting there, who are sitting in the back, who, who don't know where to turn. They got that demon in their house. God, I'm just asking you to 
Show them your purpose. It's not too late. You will take what they have now, and you will do everything that you said you would do in there before you created them in the time they have left. For these young people, God, give them a future and give them hope that you created them for your will and for your purpose, and that no man, no institution, no process can stop that. Thank you, God. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.